is Greg and welcome back to Wargaming World. I'm putting together a video of this which is Nuts version 4 and I'm going to try and make sure that by the end of this video you'll be able to play a basic game of Nuts which includes the movement, shooting, melee, morale and also to understand the unique nature of the game and why it's good for solo players. Before we start, I'd just like to say thanks to Ed Texera, and apologies if I've just butchered your surname, but thank you, the writer uh, of Nuts. I'd also like to say thanks to John Cunningham, uh, who did the digital editing of the fourth version, for all of your help thus far, and very uh, positive uh, feedback, comments, and help. So I'd just like to start by explaining why I'm doing this, and it's for two key reasons. The first, very clearly, is because I want to increase the subscription to Wargaming World. I'm very keen that by the end of 2020 I can have a thousand subscribers because I'm doing a piece of work which I like to publish which covers 2020. It's ironic really in terms of how difficult the year's been, but it's focusing on what we do through Wargaming and potentially how we've been able to get past the challenges and how Wargaming has been a really good thing in this period. Secondly, I want to focus on solo war games. Now, I do play already a solo version of World War II games, and I thought I'd ask people from the solo war gaming uh, miniatures group and ask the question, what solo game do you actually play? And although I had a, a lot of responses with a lot of different games, there was one key game which came up which was really common, and that was nuts. So I thought I'd put it together and see how that's uh, good for that solo group. So uh, I've told you why I'm doing it, so it's a question of the, the how and the what really. So how I'm going to do it is I'm going to really focus on trying to get uh, boots on the tabletop as it were. What I'm going to try and look to do first of all is look at basic rules, so to understand about the unique nature of nuts the engagement, how it's, how it's different from other I go, you go kind of games, and then go through things like uh, the movement, firing, melee, and morale at the end. Now, what's key is that at the end of those stages, you've got to be able to know that you can play a game, and I think the best thing would be for me to do that. And so a separate video to this will be uh, a game with a battle report, uh, probably something France 1940, put this together and see how we can actually play the game and see how this works. Now one comment is that actually nuts tends to be the later part of the war but I'm sure we can work around that and put that together with the, for something that's, uh, that's useful. Okay just one uh, word of warning before we start. In this video, and indeed in the subsequent video for the battle report, I'm going to make plenty of errors. Uh, also, I'm going to miss uh, lots of key salient points, so apologies in advance for that. In addition, we've also got things like this. We've got the Nuts Compendium, and it gets, gives all sorts of uh, abstract elements and really enhances the game. So, if you'd like me to continue and do a number of other videos that follow, I'm happy to do that on the metric that the subscription numbers increase in YouTube. I want people to really get engaged in this. Uh, if you don't want to, if this video isn't really to your liking, then that's absolutely fine. I won't continue it if there isn't a demand for it, that's the common sense. But ideally, I'd like to try and get connected uh, with the uh, Two Hour War Games group and get some real interaction in terms of really developing what we've got and doing justice for this game. So, let's get cracking. So the approach I'm going to take uh, looking at the uh, rules is to go through a set scenario. So we're going to look at an objective and see how a game might work normally and so each time each phase in the game will uh, ask a question. How do we move? How do we fire? What are the consequences? But there are a number of things that we need to cover first of all in terms of the rulebook. So as we look through the rulebook you'll see on screen a number of page references that you can go to and you can have a look at your leisure at the specific rules and how they apply. 
So before we start, I'd like to uh, introduce you to the tabletop. I've put this together for uh, the development of this game and uh, what you'll notice straight away is that it's uh, a fairly lengthy table. So it is in fact eight foot by about three and a half foot and uh, one of the first things you'll see in the rule book is the fact that the aiding of the game is to be played in a two hour time slot. So the tabletop we look at is normally three foot by three foot. So the concentration of this table will be this area here, but over the videos that I do I'm going to concentrate on this tabletop as a whole and take some different examples of the game all the way through. So the first thing to do is to make you aware of the tabletop and just to take a look and uh, familiarise yourself with the whole table. With this table we're going to look at a specific requirement. So you'll see that there is a, a road here and that uh, it goes through an orchard. The orchard uh, and road moves out now amongst uh, woods and then we have some fields, some of the uh, fields from the farmer and the road continues through here. Now this scenario is essentially going to be concentrated that the British, a British platoon that started with an individual section will approach through this road and their objective is to ensure that these fields are clear and safe so that they and indeed subsequent vehicles can move along and uh, use uh, the road as they would like uh, to advance. And so here we have a set of figures. Okay, so the first thing to ask is how do we define the figures? Well, the figures are referred to in two ways. They're either stars or grunts. And what's the major difference? Well, the star, well, that's the player. So I've decided that the guy with the grenade is me. So he now has a reputation of five. All other figures have a reputation of four. Now the idea of having a character here is to try and make a little bit more sense of the figures and make the game a little bit more interesting. Now an individual figure, a star, also has attributes but at this stage I'm just going to concentrate on the fact that there's a difference between grunts and stars. I mentioned the reputation or rep and that is the quality of the troop, experience, etc. And there's going to be much more of that uh, later. Now, at the moment, we've uh, determined that we have a star and we have our grunts. However, we need to understand how many uh, men will be part of the sectional squad. Now, for that, we use the lists and we roll uh, for this. So it's not that each section will have the same amount of men on paper and we need to roll for it and in this situation a British section will have five men plus 1d6 so let's take a look. Well, unfortunately this one's only going to have six as they approach uh, the uh, Germans and get on the table. Now there can be lots of reasons why that's been uh, depleted to this number. Uh, they could have been in combat or all sorts of different reasons but uh, so far we've just got six men. So. We know what the objective of the game is, we know how many people we've got in terms of the British first section coming on the table, we know uh, the uh, uh, character that's going to be uh, uh, myself, but the question is what does the table actually look like and we need to section out this area into uh, a 3x3 three three grid. So you should see on the screen now uh, what we're covering. And there's a particular reason for that, is because we want to work out what are the potential enemy forces on the table and how do we uh, understand them and how do they appear. OK, so we've got our British entering here on the uh, right at uh, the edge of the board. So let's take a look and see what that grid looks like and what potential enemy forces are there. So, we're now going to have uh, our focus on the Germans. 
We want to see where they may be and for the British where the potential enemy forces are hiding. Now what we need to do is that we have three potential enemies and we put down a marker. In this situation I'm going to put down some uh, Falchum Jaeger as a marker. We put them at the centre of each of the grid and we then see how, uh, how they move and how they activate. So you'll see on the screen now that we have numbers uh, 1 to 9. 7, 8 and 9 aren't going to be occupied because that's where the British are coming from. But it may well be anywhere on the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 etc. So let's roll and see where they are. First potential enemy. In number 4, the second. Number 1. And the third, also in number one. So we have two potential enemy forces here. That's in uh, number one. And we also have a third up here in number four. So with the British in play and with our PEF here too, it's now the turn of our turn sequence. Firstly, I'm going to roll 2d6. The black dice is the Germans, the green, the British. We rolled a 5 and a 6. This means that neither uh, force can operate because the uh, rep of the leaders is 4. However, uh, it's more than 7, so there's a possibility of reinforcements. Now, we can't reinforce the uh, uh, PEF side, the Germans, unless it's going to be uh, a double. So we'll do that uh, separately if we roll two of the same dice. But we can potentially reinforce the British. There are three factors to consider. If we're on, atta on the attack, uh, it's a plus one to this dice. On patrol, it's a minus one, which is what's the case at the moment. And we have an investment level. The investment level is always three. So therefore, well, it's, it's always three uh, in where we are at the, the moment. We start with three. So therefore, uh, it's adding two to this dice. So that's an 8. And an 8 means that the British get the rest of their platoon, which means that we add two more sections. So we're going to roll again to see how many men we get in each of those two sections. Second section, have 5 and plus 3, so we get 8. Second, as we have 5, so we have a full section, so that's 10. And as far as a platoon is concerned, we would also uh, get a leader, uh, potentially a, a second lieutenant or a, a captain perhaps, uh, joining the British, and uh, even potentially a standard uh, mortar. Now we can roll to see where the reinforcements come in, uh, but I'm going to say that they come in from uh, uh, the same road. So I'm essentially saying that uh, we've had this uh, section has been uh, on patrol and has been... Uh, uh, in advance of the, the rest of the patrol. Uh, they slowed down because they couldn't be activated in this particular turn and so the rest of the platoon simply uh, catches up. I'm going to say that the British, uh, the captain arrives uh, with the platoon so we're going to have a roll and see what uh, his uh, reputation is. Let's take a roll. And we get a five uh, so his reputation is four takes command of the uh, platoon or group. Now that we have uh, more than one uh, section, we can have a look at how groups operate as well. And uh, yeah, if we'd got a six, his leadership would have been five, but uh, four and the rest of the platoon will also remain on four. So there we have it, the whole platoon's here, and now we can move to the next turn. So can we uh, operate again? Uh, no, we can't as far as the British is concerned, but yes, we can for the Germans. Before we uh, operate again, uh, we can see that there's a possibility of further British reinforcements. Uh, so uh, let's uh, try the same test. Uh, it's a four, and uh, we reduce one because it's patrols, that's down to a three, uh, but we gain again another three which takes us to six. Now a six would allow me to bring in another section uh, plus uh, an anti-tank team so I've just brought in a boys rifle and uh, 
that's uh, that's all I'm bringing in here. Uh, we're getting a bit overcrowded at this end with the with the British, so uh, we'll keep an eye on how that uh, operates. Now the Germans can move. So for each of our uh, PEFs, I roll two d six and compare against the leadership. So three and six. So I start with the unit which is furthest away from the British, and they can move four inches because we've got one of our leadership uh, passed. Second enemy unit. Uh, that can't move at all. And the third. Again, that can't move either. So that means we move on to the third uh, turn. Can we see the British actually start moving? Yes, we can. So uh, the British can move, uh, but the Germans can't. So the British can move. And uh, we're going to move the entire group. The entire platoon is going to move uh, eight inches straight along this road. So as you can see, the British are moving uh, in good order. Uh, three separate sections. Remember there was uh, ten men, then eight, then six. So my characters are right at the back there. But now, what is the question about whether they're coming into view of the enemy? Now the British have moved along the road, but there is definitely a point at which they become in line of sight of the potential enemy uh, just before that uh, building. Now they've moved as a single group, so therefore I think we should test it as a single group, and they're also just slightly outside what would have been the uh, three foot by three foot table. Uh, but I'm still going to include it here. Uh, it uh, seems uh, nonsensical not to, but uh, it is, after all, just a guide. So we need to have a test at what is essentially the crux of the nuts game. So it's relatively simple to follow. We definitely have line of sight, and we need to understand what we've seen, if anything at all. So we need to roll 2d6, and that's against the enemy's uh, investment level. Uh, that's going to be 3, so let's see how many times we get higher than that. And the answer is once. The result of 1 means that as far as the whole platoon is concerned, then there might well be something there. So they are now activated, and are now going to act in relation to thinking that there may be something on the other side of this hedge. However, we haven't made contact, so that's the end of that situation. So, at the end of that, we then remove the marker, so uh, it's no longer uh, possible to uh, engage that point. However, we do remember that uh, the Germans still can move into that area We've still got our two markers here, and the result from the last uh, engagement, as it were, is that uh, we now roll with 3d6 when we're actually looking and engaging with these two. So it makes it much more likely that we have uh, uh, some uh, Germans on the board uh, next time round. Okay, let's start turn four. Needing uh, force. Right, okay, so the British can be activated, the British can move, uh, the Germans unfortunately can't because we've got a 5 for the Germans which is above uh, their rep level. Okay, the British have uh, moved forward, they've moved uh, 8 inches uh, further forward, and that's all three, uh, three sections of the platoon with one exception. And the exception is this, which is the British 2 inch mortar, which has stayed in position and I want to fire smoke. However, uh, the rule for mortars and smoke is not in the main rules, but it is in the compendium, so that's where we're going to need to get that rule from. So with the British appro uh, approaching, uh, the uh, uh, mortar is going to fire smoke uh, into the area uh, where we thought there was going to be uh, forces beforehand. So this is uh, worthwhile doing just to uh, follow the, uh, the rules. Um, so we need to roll, first of all, 2d6 uh, and see whether we can um, reach the rep of uh, the mortar 
and it's 2d6 needing fours. So fours required, and we've got two. Now you can see that the smoke's dropped uh, where we wanted it, but but we need to work out about the wind direction. So I'm going to say that north is directly between where the mortar team is over here and the smoke. And so we'll just work from there and I'll look on the on the table. So green first, so six and two. So what that means uh, it's going to drift west and after the, on the next activation it'll go five inches west so it'll go towards uh, well off the board really and it'll be gone after uh, two activations. So uh, that's the end of turn four so here we are with turn five. British can move again and again uh, I seem to get a very very high roll for the Germans each time but it means it's just the British moving. A couple of things here, you can see now that the British have uh, split and moved into different sections and uh, also that the because the wind is blowing the uh, smoke now drifts out to 10 inches but it will begin to drift in that direction so where it originally landed it'll uh, move across 5 inches uh, next activation and uh, that comes to the end of this turn. New turn and we need to see uh, get a bit more uh, luck for the Germans, so let's see if they can operate. Uh, yes they can. So uh, the Germans go first because they've got a higher number, the British will operate again. Now we need to determine how far the two remaining units can move. So we've got two units that can move, so let's start with the one nearest the British. We need uh, fours to see how many can move. So. Uh, he can move a total of eight inches because he's got two passes. Let's take a quick look at the uh, second unit. Unfortunately, and this happened uh, first time round, this can't uh, move at all. So uh, that doesn't move. The first one moves eight inches. So you'll see now that the uh, German marker has taken a, a position here behind the hedge. The British uh, looking to advance uh, over the hedge. So we're getting very close now. Uh, to see whether uh, again we have another point of testing whether we've uh, got not just line of sight but whether the Germans will actually appear. The first section's moved uh, whilst under the cover of smoke. The second section, this is the one with my character in, uh, is in between the two sections uh, as a support unit and this one is going to see if we can go over the head. So let's have a look and see what uh, it impacts on movement. The first two men who've gone over the hedge will now be in a line of sight here, so I think we need to work out this test to see what happens. It's going to be the same as last time. If you remember, we had two dice last time. Uh, we had one above and it meant that for every other time I was doing it, I would do it with 3d6. So I need to get 3d6 above 3. And we have just the one. Now this means again that there's nothing there, um, but uh, it means next time we do that, uh, it will mean that the it will definitely appear uh, with the uh, with the final uh, unit. Now, I think at that point the British this unit here would go prone, thinking that it might well be that they need to fire, and uh, so they don't move any further. That means as it stands at the moment we've just got one unit uh, with the uh, Germans. However, it's also worth uh, mentioning that uh, it is possible that we get more uh, uh, PEFs if we roll uh, a double when we roll the, the dice at the start of activation. So uh, it's not necessarily the case that we're, we're down to one uh, unit, but we just have to see how we go. That's the next turn. Now it's uh, turned the other way around. The British are higher, but uh, nobody is at a level of five other than my, uh, my character is always not a lead, and the Germans can move. So how far can the Germans move? Uh, they can move eight inches. So the Germans have moved to this quite uh, good defensive position here in the corner and uh, the only other thing to notice is the uh, uh, smoke is now beginning to uh, clear as it moves off the board. Next turn. British and Germans can move but the British move first. Now the British have moved uh, in all three sections and uh, this unit moves and it's got right to the end of its move 
I'm not too sure whether I would say it could see this unit here. This one definitely can't because it's more than four inches from that hedge. But the Germans themselves can definitely see the British there and uh, there's definitely line of sight from both. Now as it's down to the last unit, we know that the Germans are also going to appear, so it counts as if we've scored two uh, with the roll. So let's see what uh, a German unit appears. So the Germans are definitely here, so we need to see whether it's in a patrol kind of way or whether they're actually in a defensive position. So it's one to four, it's a standard patrol. Uh, yes it is. So we have an investment level of three, minus one because it's a patrol. Uh, plus whatever we roll here. So it's a four, so a six. So uh, we've got uh, a German squad and also an anti-tank unit as well. We've got these two figures here. Uh, now you might notice that these are 1940 troops. So I play the uh, early war and obviously these rules are fine uh, for doing it. Um, if you can just add in some details, I'm sure there isn't an anti-tank rifle detail in the rules themselves, but I'm, I'm sure we can work out uh, what would be useful if it was firing at a vehicle, which I'll do in a, a subsequent uh, video. So, uh, as it is, uh, we need to now fire at the British down there and see what their reaction will be. What we're now trying to work out is not necessarily a unit firing at a unit, but one individual firing at one individual. So let's try and uh, work it out in some detail. Well, the first test we need to do is to see who saw whom first. So we roll for uh, one dice for the rep level of the leader. So of the British it's four for the uh, captain and the same for the German. So we have four dice each looking for uh, fours. And with that uh, the Germans win so uh, they will go first. I'm going to take this rather slowly uh, but I'm going to say first of all before we look at the machine gun and the submachine gun which is just in range we're going to focus on six rifles firing at the British. So what we add up here is the weapon itself, which is a rifle, so that's a one. We have um, the reputation of the individual, which is a four, so that's a five. Plus, when we roll this dice, we're going to take it from top to bottom about what the totals are. So five added to each of this. So I've now allocated each of the dice to one individual figure. Um, we now add 5 to each of those dice, so the highest is 10, lowest 7, so let's have a look and see what happens to them, remembering that the British are in cover. Now because the British are under cover, we add 5, and so one of the numbers is a 10, and that uh, individual's hit, and the others as we go down uh, will return fire. I'll do that in a second, but let's just focus on the one where we've got the 5 there. So it's 10 in total, so it's a hit. So now we take another roll, and this roll is now to see what the consequence is. We roll a six here, uh, he's obviously killed. If we roll a four or five, uh, then he's out of the fight. And uh, if it's one, two or three, uh, then he'll have to duck back. He's a six, and he's obviously killed. Now because he's killed, that's going to prompt uh, something else, which is the reaction test. So we'll need to do that as well. Now with the remainder, because they're all um, in cover, um, all that's going to happen here is that they will uh, return fire. Uh, but I can't do it yet, because we've still got to do the machine gun, and also the submachine gun before we do that. Now the submachine gun's going to fire, but it's going to fire at its extreme range. So although normally we could count um, that it would hit maybe three figures uh, going back into the second and third rank we're just going to say for simplicity's sake it's going to hit the front one uh, but when we do the light machine gun it's going to do that so we'll pick that up in the rules in a moment so first of all the submachine gun is going to fire uh, with the first guy who's already got uh, a four against him so the weapon has a factor of a three plus a reputation of a four it takes us to seven and a five, so uh, that's a hit as well. And let's see the consequence. Uh, that's another kill. So we've got uh, two men killed. And uh, again, that's going to be a, a factor that we're going to have to work out. Um, we'll do the light machine gun, and then we'll see what the reaction is before the uh, British respond. Now, the idea here is that actually there is a, a, a width, if you like, of when you fire 
uh, you've got um, a width which is the same as your target uh, radius and uh, that means that the target with the machine gun here uh, is 5 uh, so it's a factor of 5 and if we have the, the width of 5 inches certainly it would count to all of the figures uh, that are there that could be hit by the machine gun um, we could actually have done it with the, the rifles as well you've got a, a 1 inch width so therefore you could have had 2 or 3 in the, in the shot uh, but uh, at least we're covering it in the rules here with the light machine gun so uh, we've got a, a target factor of 5 and there are a total of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, uh, 7 men so we've got 7 uh, that we're rolling and we'll see how we go Right, so we've got a reputation of 4, the gun is 5, so that's 9s already, and uh, 7 men. So let's work that out. Well in fact, uh, everybody's hit because we're adding 9 uh, for the gun plus the uh, reputation, so that's 9, and then the minimum of 1 would take us to 10, so they're all hit, and I think the, uh, the learning point from this is not to all bunch up like that, which has uh, been... Uh, you know the the reason for uh, so many potential casualties so let's roll for that I will go um, left to right here in terms of uh, what the outcome is so one means it's lower than the reputation uh, so that person on the far left hand side will duck back next one will do the same the officer behind him is killed the NCO behind him, I should say. And the next duck's back. One with the machine gun team. He ducks back. Last time the machine gun is a four. Uh, so uh, he's out for the count, I think. And then finally we've got our officer, our captain. And he'll duck back. Now as a result that means uh, all of them, I think in total, uh, will now uh, duck back and we've got one guy who's uh, out for the count. Right, so this unit is going to have to take a reaction test. So it's the morale test, so we first of all test the leader and see whether we can use his uh, rep. He gets a 6, so that's uh, a no, we'll roll a 2d6. And uh, we've got one pass uh, and one uh, is a five. So all of the uh, unit here, all uh, six men, uh, will end up with a one uh, there because uh, their rep is four, so we can only count one uh, for all six of them. And uh, with that, the whole um, group will duck back. So uh, they duck back, they won't fire, and uh, that will end the turn. So, the state of the game is the British are advancing, but now they've uh, been caught by a uh, German unit, and they're, they're holding them off. Now, uh, I'm not doing a full battle here, I um, just want to uh, cover all of the uh, rules, the basic rules, so you could start playing uh, yourself. So, I'm going to advance the game a little, and uh, make sure that we can have a look at uh, melee, and possibly at one or two of the attributes of my star player. And so I've advanced the game a little. Uh, the British have been helped by uh, some mortar fire, which has cut off the uh, German machine gun team. And as the uh, uh, smoke drifts away in the same direction it had beforehand, the British have been able to compose themselves there and uh, get themselves in a, a firefight, causing some casualties with the Germans. So it then leaves to this unit, who've advanced behind the uh, the cover of the smoke and to prepare for a charge as the smoke drifts away. I've removed a tree there and just so you can see the unit so this unit here including my uh, uh, star man uh, is going to charge and attack uh, the Germans here. We'll have to make the assumptions that all of the uh, the moves have been okay etc so I'm going to test all the various reactions that we need to do and go through the melee sequence. Now we're about to uh, get into combat, but I just want to spend a little bit of time 
on what is essentially the first part of the rules, which is about our star man and uh, about the fact that we have star advantages and we've also got potential attributes. So this is uh, my star man, this is, uh, this is me. And uh, so we can start off with uh, four advantages. Now this is completely optional and I think it's particularly relevant where the game is often played by people where we only have uh, perhaps maybe 10 figures aside and then you've got plenty of time to add characteristics to each individual but with this uh, larger game uh, we're just really just uh, focusing on this one in particular. Now in terms of these uh, star advantages uh, there are four in particular uh, star power, uh, larger than life, cheat death and uh, free will. Now you can pick all four of them or you can have two, three or just the one or none at all. Now I'm not going to go into detail of each one but uh, they're on page five of the rules and I'll let you uh, take a look at the advantages of each. Now you might well remember at the start of the video I talked about the difference between stars and grunts. Stars have also two attributes whereas uh, grunts have one. Again I'm taking this as optional because uh, the number of the figures on the table if they all had uh, characteristics, I, I couldn't follow and keep an eye on uh, on all of them. So uh, I'm just going to concentrate for the sake of this video on my character and his two potential attributes and how that might benefit him as we go into melee. Now here's our uh, uh, key character. So uh, we have, uh, first of all, we roll for a table. There are six tables and we roll a second dice to see which attribute uh, for the first skill. So here we're in table five and attribute two. So this attribute is uh, sickly. Uh, he has uh, a slow attribute and counts the rep uh, one less when taking the after the battle recovery test. Now I could choose a second but I'm not going to. I'm just going to roll and see what we get. This time it's on the first table and number two. So our hero is an athlete. Uh, he counts plus 1d6 when taking the fast move test and counting the best 2d6 results. First thing we need to do is to take a check on whether the unit will charge. So we need to look on the reaction test. That's a four. Yes, they will. The first thing we need to do is to take a charge into melee test. So we have the rep of all of the figures with the exception of my character which is this one uh, here his rep is five and everybody else's is four so we take an individual test in terms of how um, whether they're successful against uh, the other and then we calculate what the group has done as a whole so I'll do this uh, one by one character his reps five but the Germans are in cover so we need a four and that's passed. The remaining five have uh, a rep of four, uh, but we've got a cover for the Germans, so we need threes. And so all but one are successful. The Germans uh, require fours. Uh, the British don't count as uh, with cover. That's less successful. Three are successful. Consequence, it means that the British attack the charge is successful and they reach into melee uh, with the Germans uh, unable to fire. Right, okay, so we get to the uh, nitty gritty here. So uh, we've got three uh, the Wargaming World dice each. The uh, character, this is my character here, uh, he's uh, attacking. He has a bayonet, uh, but the uh, German NCO also has a knife. So you would start with 2d6, you get plus one for uh, a melee weapon, and now we roll. So my rep is five to the German four and that's three hits uh, against three hits so that looks uh, just the same as it's equal then both uh, lose one rep and uh, they have they continue the fight immediately fours and threes so the British have uh, at three as opposed to uh, now the German two. Well, the German officer is uh, out of the fight, so let's just carry on a little and have a look uh, and see how the remainder of the uh, fighting uh, concludes. Recall. The rep is four for each, and uh, for that one, again, it's equal, uh, just one each. Try that again. 
This time it's down to three, so the British just get one, but the Germans two. So it's the uh, uh, British uh, soldier who's uh, out of the fight. Again, needing fours. And uh, equal again. So down to threes. And uh, the uh, nobody's successful there. Down to twos. Again, it's uh, equal. Down to ones. And the Germans. Right, okay, so they are um, successful and uh, knocks out uh, the uh, British soldier. On to the uh, fourth uh, fight. Back to fours. That's the, again, one more for the British, uh, for the Germans, I should say. Uh, so that's another uh, uh, Britain who's out, uh, out of the fight. Down to the last two, looking at fours. Uh, this time it's uh, a British success. Last one. Yeah, British are successful with two, but Germans are successful with three. So, at the end of that very uh, bloody engagement, the British have lost uh, four men who are uh, out of the fight, and uh, the Germans have lost two. The uh, My character is going to be the leader, so we're going to test on him to see if we get a plus one or a one d6 with that character. Yes, we do. We then roll at 2d6. Six and a three. So this means that uh, we have the leader, which is uh, one for us, and then we have uh, an additional one for each character. So they end up with two. So it's man down at two, and we are uh, certainly at uh, half, uh, half numbers. As a result of that, we'll duck back duck back uh, into cover. And at that point we pause uh, for breath and uh, I'm going to stop here on this, uh, this video. It's uh, covered, I think, all of the basic areas that we would want to do in order to start a game. So we originally started in this corner, then we've, uh, we've moved, we've approached with the uh, British, we've moved across in different uh, different groups as well as in a platoon. We've then uh, fired uh, a mortar so we've gone through uh, those rules. We've had our PEFs, they've uh, disappeared at that end and again uh, when they came uh, all the way up here they disappeared. Naturally there was only one remaining in this field. They've been deployed, we've had uh, shooting and we've had melee. So we'll have a look at uh, at morale. We've had a, a brief look at the attributes. We've also had uh, reinforcements, and that's how the uh, British got a whole platoon uh, out here. And uh, right at the start, we had a look at the table and how we can, uh, you know, use uh, whether it's a small or a large table. It's entirely up to you. But we've also had a look at the uh, the main grid here, uh, that was across uh, three foot by three foot. Uh, it just leaves me to say thanks very much for watching. I really appreciate uh, uh, watching the uh, the video and, uh, and any any comments and thoughts about uh, how this can improve. And indeed, as I said at the start of the video, the inevitable errors I'm sure I've made with it. Uh, I'd like to say thanks to Ed again and to uh, to John. It's been really helpful as I've uh, put this video together. And finally, I'd be really grateful if you subscribe to the Wargaming World. Uh, channel. Looking to get to a thousand subscribers by uh, the end of the year if I can. And uh, if there's a demand for other videos of this, either battle reports or uh, further rules like uh, vehicles, indirect fire, direct fire, all sorts of different things, then I'll be very happy to uh, do other videos and uh, put them together. So thanks very much and uh, see you soon.